Welcome uh, everybody to this very special lecture. Um, each year we uh, celebrate one of our very own researchers uh, who has shown excellent in, in research, in service, in being part of the, of the BRI and the neuroscience community. And this started, as you see, in 1989 and has been an ongoing tradition now until uh, 2019. The lecture is given uh, in uh, honor of Horace Magoon, who, as I think all of you know, uh, was one of the founders of the BRI, the Brain Research Institute. If you don't know that, you should go onto the website and look it up. There is a very nice write-up that was actually written by Chris uh, on, uh, on all the accomplishments uh, of uh, Horace Magoon. So you see the lectures here, and I think we're really fortunate to have a other exciting lecturer today, and I let Chris introduce her. The other thing that we do at the, at the Magoon lecture is honor one of our graduate students who has, uh, who has identified herself uh, or themselves as a, as a fantastic researcher. Um, what you need to do in order to either win the Kavan Prize, which is what we're giving out now, or be able to give the Idison lecture that we had a couple of weeks ago, you need to convince your PI to nominate you and actually you need to apply for the position. So this is going to come up in a, in a couple of months again. Uh, we'll, we'll be looking for, it for the next speaker, uh, for the next uh, Kavan Prize Winner. So, so this uh, this week today, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Nina Lichtenberg on this slide. She's a graduate student with Kate Wasson, who will uh, introduce her. But before we do that, I'm going to uh, invite you up onto the stage and give you the nice plaque that you're uh, going to get and sure. congratulate you to winning the Kavan Prize. I'll tell you a little bit about what Nina, um, actually now very proud to say Dr. Lichtenberg, uh, has been doing over the course of her PhD. Um, she has uh, very sort of rigorously and thoroughly been picking apart some elements of the cortical limbic circuit, and she's identified uh, an important component of this circuit that's vital for our ability to retrieve memories of rewarding events and then to implement this information in our decisions. And specifically, she's found that the orbital frontal cortex and the basal lateral amygdala share reciprocal connections with one another, and that this holds true for not only the lateral subdivision of the orbital frontal cortex, but also the more understudied medial uh, subdivision, and that this reciprocal circuitry is really important for allowing stimuli in the environment to trigger memories of associated rewards and for those memories to then go on to inform adaptive conditional responding um, and decision making in new situations. Um, and beyond that, she's taken these methods and she's taught them to people around UCLA, some of whom are sitting here in the room, as well as people at many other institutions across the country. So her reach has been really far in enabling people to ask their own questions and to make their own discoveries. On top of all that research, Nina has engaged in quite a bit of outreach, um, most notably with the uh, DOPA team, where she's been working with undergrads here at UCLA, and they're going into public schools and educating kids about addictive substances so that they can make informed decisions about their own drug use. Um, this is a great time for Nina to get uh, this award because she is leaving this afternoon uh, to embark on the next phase of her career. Okay, well I'd like to congratulate Nina as well. Um, Nina was in our outreach class and she was fantastic. Um, Nina was also actually in the T32, which um, ED has directed for since uh, 2013 now, I think. 2014, 2013, somewhere around there. Okay, so, um, and uh, good luck Nina on all future. <laughs> okay, so, um, I, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Edie for this award. Um, Edie's uh, been here since around 2000. And she was a visiting professor and then she got uh, incorporated into UCLA. Um, but Edie really is a East Coast, really from the East Coast. She's an East Coast girl, I would say, rather than uh, West Coast. She um, did all of her ed education in the East Coast. 
And then she went to NIH, and she went to a number of institutes um, uh, at NIH and ended up at NIDA. I think for about a decade she was at NIDA, and it was here that she really excelled and, and started working on using imaging to analyze um, different aspects of addiction. Uh, she made it, mostly used PET when she was at um, NIDA, and uh, if you look on the web, you get some really nice pictures of Edie putting people into PET machines and, and uh, describing how PET works. Uh, she's, there's some very, very nice pictures of her on the web for that. And uh, she was there, as I say, for about a decade and then came to UCLA. Huh? Maybe longer? <laughs> Okay, so um, at UCLA, um, it is sort of spread her wings a little, gone into a bit of um, MRI and uh, still keeping on the addiction, which uh, we're very strong at UCLA in addictions, um, and it's good to see a couple of people getting awards for, the, for their addiction research. It's good to see. And she's been working um, a lot on uh, psychostimulants um, and how how they may, you know, psychostimulants, uh, there isn't any good medications for psychostimulants. And uh, it has been trying to figure out what might work. Um, Modafinil, she's played around with a little, and a few other drugs, but um, she's uh, been trying to get um, some uh, insights into uh, psychostimulants. So over the years, I can say that uh, it has really made a big, big impact on addiction research. Um, she has um, close to 400 original papers and an H index of 72, which is pretty env enviable for most. Oh, more than that. 80? She's saying 80. <laughs> the last time we looked, it was 72. So she must have done really well in the last few months. Um, anyway, it's a very, very high H index, um, much higher than mine. And um, she's really, really made a big impact. Uh, I think she has, as I say, um, she has uh, eight citations which have over five, of, uh, eight, eight uh, publications which have over 500 citations, which are citation classics. So it's really, really impressive. But I think <clears throat> in addition to her great research, which she's going to talk to you about, um, she's really made a big impact with, within the neuroscience community, and especially the addiction community within UCLA. Um, she's, um, we've uh, looked after the Integrative Center for Addictions, and that's um, now um, you know, gathering all the addiction people together. She's run this T32, which is a really quite a big job to run a T32, and, um, and mentored many, many postdocs and graduate students um, throughout the years she's been here. I would say she's been the glue to the addiction program, and I think she's very, very worthy of this Magoon Award. So congratulations, <laughs> Phoebe. Thanks so much, Chris, and thank you uh, for being such a wonderful community that I've had the pleasure of enjoying for 20 years now. And um, it's a great honor, uh, and I am in great company, and I very, very much appreciate the support of my colleagues to bring me to this point. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about neural systems, dopamine receptors, dopamine receptor subtypes, and stimulant use, and how we might be able to use brain imaging as a guide to develop therapeutics. But before we get into the talk, I'd like to thank two people, uh, Walter Ling, who uh, changed my life by convincing me to move to Los Angeles and, uh, and connect the brain imaging community with the excellent addiction research that was already at UCLA, and Peter Weibrow, who's an extraordinary uh, department chairman and has really given opportunities to basic scientists like me to uh, work with uh, clinicians and address problems that are very important in the mental health field. I'd also like to offer special thanks to my colleagues who've been with me for 
quite a long time, Dara Garamani, a cognitive uh, neuroscientist, and Andy Dean, a, a neuropsychologist who've really helped me build and run the lab and help train uh, lots of young people that came through. And two of our outstanding trainees, Angelica Morales and Milky Kono, um, who did a lot of the work on MRI and uh, methamphetamine abuse that I'll be presenting today. They're both now assistant professors at the Oregon Health Sciences University. So now to the problem, and the problem is enormous. There is a staggering uh, number of Americans who've died from overdoses, and these are the data from 2017 from the CDC. Those are the latest published figures, and um, every indication from their uh, preliminary data for 2018 indicates that the trends for increasing overdose deaths in the United States are rising. And you can see there's a tremendous uh, increase in the use of synthetic opioids leading to death uh, from really around 2005 up to now, very, very sharp increase. But what we don't talk about quite as much is the fact that the opioid crisis has pretty much eclipsed a crisis in stimulant abuse. And here you see a tremendous uh, sharp increase, especially uh, even since 2013, in the use of cocaine and amphetamines leading to overdose deaths in our country. Now, um, it's, it's true that in uh, 2017, 73% of the cocaine-related deaths have also involved the use of opioids, 50% uh, of the deaths due to amphetamine-type stimulants uh, have included opioids as part of the reason for death as well. So, in fact, there is a great reason for us to um, search for a medication. As Chris said, there's no approved medication for stimulant use disorder, and really the standard of care is... Uh, behavioral treatments, cognitive behavioral therapy, contingency management, but relapse rates with these behavioral treatments is enormously high, and we really need some new interventions. Now, in order to develop the appropriate interventions, what researchers are doing is thinking about the different factors that promote addiction. In general, addiction is promoted by positive reinforcement. In other words, the good feeling that someone gets when they take a drug that will increase the likelihood that they will take it again. Negative reinforcement, or the ability of the drug to make bad feelings go away. Uh, drug craving, which is cited as a very often reason for relapse. And what we've been focusing on more so lately is dysfunction in inhibitory control systems and faulty decision making. Now, with respect to positive reinforcement, we've known from decades of work in the animal literature that um, acute drugs of abuse administration produces a release of dopamine in the nucleus accumbens, and uh, this produces a reward and increases the likelihood that the animal will self-administer the drug of abuse. We've then, in the human literature, uh, taken advantage of brain imaging techniques and positron emission tomography, which is a nuclear medicine uh, technique really became only available in the late 1970s, the first PET scanner uh, developed by Mike Phelps, our chairman of pharmacology and others in the same laboratory, the first PET scanner at NIH in uh, 
in uh, 1980. And when we did our first studies of the acute euphorogenic administration of drugs of abuse with positron emission tomography, we used fluorodeoxyglucose, a tracer for glucose metabolism, providing maps of brain activity. And here, this red in the placebo condition indicates lots and lots of brain activity. And shockingly, cocaine produced a global decrease in cerebral glucose metabolism. Now, that study was published in 1990, uh, when I was 10. And this study, <laughs> uh, published just recently by uh, Eric um, Maltby at, uh, at, um, at Vanderbilt, uh, indicates that doing resting state functional connectivity in uh, an unanesthetized monkey, it's really quite a feat. What you see is that there's um, a shift in uh, the voxel-wise activity for connectivity um, of, of the, uh, within the brain. And this decrease in connectivity is almost global. And this voxel-wise map indicates in blue all of the areas where there's a decrease in connectivity of the voxels, an exception being the nucleus accumbens, where if anything, there is um, a non-significant increase in activity. Now, this decrease in activity indicates that for sure there's a loss in frontostriatal connectivity, and this frontostriatal loss could be related to some of the deficits in executive function that we see uh, in, in drug addicts. And this is a phenomenon after acute drug administration and not quite as globally uh, uh, significant with chronic drug administration. And so we think that this decrease in executive function linked to perhaps loss of frontostriatal connectivity could in fact be an important therapeutic target, which we'll discuss later. Now, making bad feelings go away or negative reinforcement is a really important reason that people keep taking drugs, whether the drugs are heroin, cigarettes, uh, whatever they are, cocaine. And in stimulant users, uh, there's really high negative affect. Um, in self-reports on the Breck depression inventory, uh, methamphetamine users who are not under the influence report uh, very high depression. Uh, just to give you context, 18 is an extremely high score. Uh, when someone reports an 18, we call a clinician because this person may be, you know, close to uh, suicidal. The Hamilton anxiety rating, which is a physician uh, rating, also shows the stimulant abusers are high. And the ratings of uh, depression and anxiety here as pictured depression are correlated with um, recent methamphetamine use. Now, taking this to the area of brain imaging with positron emission tomography and fluorodeoxyglucose, uh, the first studies uh, that we did here at UCLA uh, with PET and fluorodeoxyglucose showed a high correlation between self-reported depression and anxiety and metabolic activity in the amygdala. Uh, on the other hand, there was a high correlation, negative correlation, between activity in the prefrontal cortex and anxiety. And in fact, chronic methamphetamine users, when they're not under the influence, have hypometabolic activity in the cortex and hypermetabolism in the medial temporal lobe, especially uh, the amygdala. Now, the amygdala is a very important player in another factor that is uh, a key to addiction, that being drug craving. And in the very first studies of drug craving that were done with imaging, we showed um, that the activation in the amygdala when people had cue-induced craving, in other words, they were reporting increased craving when they were watching videotapes of scenes related to cocaine. 
and uh, activation in the amygdala as well as dorsolateral prefrontal cortex were highly correlated with the self-reports of craving. And since that first study in 1996, there were many more studies of drug craving. And here's another one from our lab showing uh, when scanners were improved and resolution was greater, we had um, important changes in brain activity in the anterior cingulate and the insula. And these are areas of the brain that have been implicated in craving for drugs of abuse uh, other than stimulants, nicotine, opioids. And um, we also were interested in the molecular signature or correlate of this metabolic change in the brain during cocaine craving, during Q-induced craving. And so we went ahead and did a study where we used positron emission tomography to measure receptor binding. And the tracer we used was carbon-11 raclopride, which binds to D2-type dopamine receptors. And I say D2-type rather than just D2, because most of the tracers that have been used are non-selective, and they bind as well to D3 receptors, part of the D2 receptor family, different from the D1 receptor family. And these uh, areas of the uh, dorsal striatum, uh, primarily the anterior putamen, show where uh, the change in dopamine release measured by displacement of this radio tracer with PET was correlated with uh, the induction of craving by watching these videotapes. And there's a highly significant relationship that was reported the same year by another laboratory. And so the D2 receptors or dopamine release are important in the positive affective responses to drugs of abuse and also in the appetitive feeling state associated with craving. But yet the D2 receptor system in addicts, including methamphetamine addicts, is deficient. And we measured binding to dopamine receptors with a positron uh, emitter, uh, F18, uh, and phallipride. And these are the regions of the brain, and this is striatum, this is caudate, putamen, uh, showing the difference between a group of methamphetamine users and a group of healthy controls, and, uh, and making measurements in different regions of the striatum. In the caudate putamen, the deficit is on the order of about 14, 15%, but it's also statistically significant in the nucleus accumbens. So there is, throughout the striatum, and to some extent in other areas of the brain, but yet, because the signal is not as great in these other areas, we really can't get statistically significant findings. And this D2 receptor deficit that we're going to be talking about a, a little bit later is related to a lot of the important factors that are um, driving addiction. Now, one of these factors um, is impulsivity and maladaptive decision-making. And whether the addiction is a behavioral one uh, or food or drugs, we all believe that addictions involve a lack of self-control. And self-control can be measured uh, as an impulsivity trait uh, by self-report. And the standard of measurement is the Barat Impulsiveness Scale. And my colleague Steve Reese in the psychology department has developed a biphasic model of um, the BIS-11, uh, which is actually now um, highly cited. He discovered that uh, psychometrically, the way the BIS was evaluated was not right, but whether you use the cognitive or the behavioral subscales, the scale related to planning or, um, or um, hyperkinesia, methamphetamine users self-report, this is when they're not under the influence of the drug, um, they self-report impulsive trait. And we 
evaluated the extent to which this was related to D2 dopamine receptors and found, indeed, that there is a negative correlation between impulsivity and D2 dopamine receptor availability. And here in the methamphetamine user, you can see that throughout the striatum, you have a very robust and widespread correlation. The lower the receptor availability, the higher the impulsivity. And in healthy controls, you have this relationship as well, but it's restricted to a smaller area with respect to statistical significance, just a ribbon of the putamen. And this difference may be related to the fact that the methamphetamine users, in fact, have a deficit in D2 dopamine receptors. So the dopamine receptors that are there really count a little bit more than in the controls where there are extra receptors. So impulsivity has been measured and perhaps mislabeled uh, in uh, many laboratories with respect to the type of task that's been utilized to measure it. And the way I think of it, impulsivity is most clearly um, evaluated using the self-report personality indices. But there are laboratory tests of self-control. And if you think of impulsive action as an action that's not controlled, we can break it down into different components and different functions that can be measured in the laboratory. One function that's measured in the laboratory is motor response inhibition, and it can be generally measured with what we call no-go no tasks, or what we've used a lot is the stop signal task, which is a type of go, no-go task, and it measures a person's ability to stop. For example, if a person is driving along and a child runs in front of the car, it's important to be able to stop quickly. And motor response inhibition is a measure of that ability. Another type of inhibitory control is, uh, is required for cognitive flexibility, the ability to shift set and not be stuck and perseverate. And uh, this uh, type of function is measured with reversal learning tasks. And I'd like to show you some of the data that we've obtained with uh, the stop signal task and reversal learning tasks. So with the stop signal task, many of you know this, uh, a person can view a stimulus, which is a left or right pointing arrow, and the instruction is push a button that corresponds to the arrow as fast as you can, and the response time is measured. This is called the go response time, but on a certain number of trials, generally 20%, there's a stop signal, and the person is instructed then to withhold an ongoing prepotent response. And a computer program is used to move the uh, appearance or change the lag to the appearance of the stop signal up to the time that a person can uh, correctly inhibit 50% of the time. And the difference between the stop signal delay and the go reaction time is calculated as the stop signal reaction time that being a measure of a person's ability to stop. And methamphetamine users are impaired on the stop signal task. They have a significantly longer stopping time. And their stopping time is, in fact, correlated with the number or the amount of methamphetamine that they've used recently. Now, it would be of interest to evaluate to what extent that deficit is related to neural structure or neural function. And um, one, of the, one of the areas that has really come up as important in motor response inhibition is uh, the right inferior frontal cortex. Uh, and damage to this region of the brain, it's shown through studies that do not involve addiction, Parkinson's disease, for example, uh, impairs uh, inhibition on the stop signal task. And we found uh, in our first structural MRI study that there was a significant deficit, and these are 
These are difference maps. In other words, what you're looking at is the right and left hemisphere of a group of control individuals compared to a group of methamphetamine users. And the yellow highlighted area um, or circled area is the right inferior frontal gyrus where the methamphetamine users show a deficit of about 7%. And this finding was replicated uh, over in the laboratory with a different uh, instrumentation, different research participants. And in fact, um, the intensity of the gray matter in the right inferior frontal gyrus, the pars orbicularis, is negatively correlated with craving for methamphetamine. Now, this craving for methamphetamine can be considered a control function because in these individuals who were in the hospital, they knew they weren't getting methamphetamine for a month, and they were tested here at one to two weeks of abstinence, and uh, they were still craving, and their craving was related, among other things, to uh, the structure of the right inferior frontal gyrus, and in fact, uh, craving for methamphetamine is correlated with performance on the stop signal task, greater craving, uh, longer stopping time. So the question that we had then was to what extent is this related to D2 dopamine receptors, which we already knew were related to, um, to impulsivity by self-report. And in this study, uh, headed by Dara Garamani, you can see that um, using phalipride in pet in healthy people, uh, there's a relationship between stop signal reaction time, negative correlation with D2 type receptor availability uh, throughout the striatum. And this uh, correlation of behavioral performance to dopamine receptor availability was extended to show that not only is behavioral performance, but also activation measured with fMRI uh, is correlated with striatal D2 receptor binding. And the yellow highlighted areas show that the striatum and areas of prefrontal cortex are those where this relationship was uh, statistically significant. So these studies in healthy controls showed the relevance of striatal dopamine D2 receptors to inhibitory control. And we started thinking about a model that had been developed um, by Logan and Cowan in 1984 for interacting D1, D2 systems in the striatum. And there is a direct pathway activated by D1 receptors in the striatum, which are low affinity, so they're primarily activated by phasic dopamine release, uh, perhaps when there is an imminent reward in the environment. Um, and this activation of D1 receptors uh, then disinhibits the thalamus, leading to greater cortical activation and um, activity through the corticospinal pathway. On the other hand, the indirect pathway is activated by D2 dopamine receptors in the striatum. D2 dopamine receptors are high affinity. Therefore, they can be activated by the lower concentrations of dopamine that are tonically um, in the synapse. And through this indirect pathway going through the globus pallidus pars externa and the subthalamic nucleus, ultimately, um, the thalamus is inhibited with less activation uh, in the cortex. Now, with respect to the D1, D2 interaction, uh, this model has been supported by pharmacological evidence. And um, here we see in a study where um, the D1 antagonist, sharing 23390, was injected into uh, the rat striatum. Um, you, produce diff you produce an effect on stopping speed. And um, in fact, what you see with the D1 antagonist sharing 23390, you see an improvement because stopping uh, SSRT, or the stopping speed, is reduced. But yet, when sulpride, the D2 antagonist, was given, you see impairment. 
Now, um, that was the first report of directly contrasting roles of D1 and D2 receptors in the striatum during response inhibition. One of the questions is what happens in people? And in people, there's at least one study, uh, this one showing that cobergoline, a D2 receptor agonist, improves stopping, uh, reducing the stop signal reaction time from the response in placebo. Now, um, these data in healthy controls therefore indicated that the D2 dopamine system really was important in inhibitory control, but in addition to motor response inhibition, which is one of the functions uh, that requires cognitive control, another one uh, that I mentioned involves cognitive flexibility. And these tasks, both um, the inhibitory control tasks with stop signal reaction time and the assessment of cognitive flexibility with here reversal learning tasks can be implemented in people, non-human primates, rodents. And um, an example of a reversal learning task here pictured as for a primate is one where the animal learns an association. In other words, pushing the red cross will provide a reward, banana. And uh, then this response over time uh, is retained. And then the rules change. And if the animal pushes the button for um, the red cross, he doesn't get a reward. And he has to learn that it's the yellow circle that will pr produce the reward. And the number of trials that the animal takes to reacquire or acquire this new association is a measure of cognitive flexibility or the ability of the animal to modify uh, his or her set. Now, one of our graduate students in David Yench's lab, Stephanie Groman, showed that there was, in fact, a relationship between D2-like receptor availability in the striatum and here, um, the blue areas show where the association was statistically significant. And it's in the dorsal and not the ventral striatum. And this series of work um, was accompanied by pharmacological studies. This study was done in the vervet monkey, as well as another study that we did. And in this study, uh, reversal learning was tested after the administration of a D2 antagonist or a D1 antagonist. And you can see that in the reversal phase, raclopride, the D2 antagonist, increased the number of trials to criterion, had no effect on new learning. And the sharing 23390, the D1 antagonist, really had no significant effects at all. And with the raclopride study, the impairment was in fact due to perseverative errors, where the animal continued to go back to the original association that was no longer valid. So D2 receptors in the striatum are important for a variety of um, functions that involve inhibitory control. And it would be very, and we already know that D2 receptor availability is reduced or, or down uh, to some extent, there may have been some deficit prior to drug taking in methamphetamine users. But in methamphetamine users, when we use the D1 and the D1 ligand, uh, NNC112, we saw no difference between methamphetamine users in healthy controls and the availability of D1 receptors in the striatum. But yet, we see the typical 14% deficit in D2 receptor binding. So in fact, what you're seeing is that there is an imbalance between the direct and indirect pathways, which could have significant impact on a person's ability to uh, change their direction and stop being a drug abuser and control himself. Now, the D1 receptors, aside from 
uh, antagonizing D2 receptor activity, we believe are also involved in the toxicity due to methamphetamine. And if, you, if we evaluate and controls, this is total cortical gray matter thickness measured with, with structural MRI, and there's no relationship between uh, cortical thickness and D1 receptor availability in the striatum in healthy controls. But there is, in fact, a, uh, a negative association uh, such that the higher the D2 recept D1 receptor availability in the striatum, the smaller the cortical thickness, suggesting that this activation of cortex, which is repeated and involves glutamate release, may be involved in an adaptation, perhaps even glutamate-induced neurotoxicity in the cortex from chronic phasic activation of the D1 receptors. So the methamphetamine users have a deficit in D1 receptors, an imbalance between D1 and D2 receptors in the striatum. They have cortical deficits, and they make bad decisions. And so one of the things we would like to do is to understand the circuitry and the neurochemical underpinnings of maladaptive decision-making in methamphetamine users. Now, in the real world, these are the decisions they have to make. Do you want to take the drug or stay sober? Do you want to engage in crim criminal activity in order to uh, engage in drug taking? And with respect to risk, are you going to engage in high-risk or low-risk behaviors? And some of these high-risk behaviors really lead to um, a number of other diseases, such as HIV. In the laboratory, we've modeled these kinds of decisions. Uh, one type of task is what we call a delayed discounting task where there is a cost for getting the reward, and the cost is delay. And so in the laboratory, the test will allow the person to make choices between immediate low-gain rewards, um, smaller, sooner rewards, or high-gain delay rewards, larger, later rewards. There are also gambling tasks. Uh, some of them involve card games where there are decks that have high gain for every card, but um, high loss as well, sprinkled through the deck more frequently than in the low gain, lower loss decks where healthy controls learn over the course of drawing 100 cards that they're better off sticking to the low gain, more boring decks. Um, there's also um, a great interest in risk taking and how that is related to addiction. And we have uh, tests that involve risk and ambiguity in the laboratory. Now, with respect to delay discounting, uh, we found ultimately that it's related to striatal dopamine D2 receptors. But here, these functions uh, represent uh, how much a person will uh, discount a reward if, if it's delayed. And we believe that taking a smaller, sooner reward is an impulsive choice. Uh, and so people have defined uh, performance on this task with respect to low, moderate, or high impulsivity, depending on the discounting rate, which can be uh, determined from usually a hyperbolic uh, function uh, and defined as K. Now, methamphetamine users tend to discount delayed options more steeply than controls. They tend to be more impulsive in their choices on these tasks. But uh, in a sample of 30 people, and we've done this twice, uh, the difference is not statistically significant. But what is statistically significant is that discount rate is correlated negatively with striatal D2 type receptor availability. And the p-value uh, for the combined sample for this correlation is 0 0.016 um, for because, but in the 
uh, healthy controls alone, the sample is, although within the same uh, direction, it's uh, not statistically significant, whereas it is for the methamphetamine users. So the methamphetamine users have uh, a tendency to discount delays, and this is related to their dopamine receptor availability, which is, in fact, reduced as compared to what you see in healthy people. We've moved beyond uh, the delay discounting task to think in terms of other complicated behavioral tasks, and one of them is the balloon analog risk task. And it was uh, adapted for fMRI, and um, it can be performed during fMRI to measure brain function when somebody is making decisions on the task. And what happens is that at each, in each frame, the individual sees a balloon. It's red, blue, or white. And the red and blue balloons are active. And they're told they have a choice each time. You can pump the balloon, and it'll get bigger, and you can get more money. Or you can cash out and be safe. Because if you're not safe, and you pump too much, uh, the balloon is going to burst, and all of the reward is lost. And um, of course, the white balloon is there with no monetary value, and individuals are not told uh, the uh, number of pumps that it would take for the balloon to burst, and they're randomly uh, selected uh, up to uh, 8 or 12, depending on the balloon color. But with the white balloon, there's no bursting, and the balloon doesn't change size, and it's uh, a control for the uh, motor uh, behavior that the person is engaged in during the task. Uh, now, because the, pers the person is not informed about the, the balloon breakpoints, uh, the absence of that information allows for us to um, get information on learning uh, of the individual throughout the task. And with the fMRI studies that we did, remember that risk increases with each pump, and we then could evaluate whether brain function changes linearly with this increase in risk. So we did parametric analysis to test for this linear relationship between pump number and brain activation, and we referred to uh, that association as modulation, modulation of brain activation during risk-taking or during cashing out uh, as a function of how many pumps or how much risk is there. And in healthy controls, what um, Milky Kono found was that when uh, people are taking risk, there is a modulation by risk in uh, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the insula. So the amount of risk makes a difference. And when cashing out, when deciding to take the safe option, um, the modulation of activation in the striatum is correlated with pump number. And in both cases, uh, this modulation of activation measured with fMRI is related to striatal D2 dopamine receptors. And it's, in fact, with respect to activation of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, you see a negative association with receptor availability. And with activation in the striatum, you see a positive association. Now, we were concerned that by just measuring one little indication of dopamine function, the dopamine receptor availability, we weren't really getting a picture of dopaminergic action. And therefore, we constructed a polygenic, not a polygenic, but a multi-gene score, a composite of five genes that all relate to uh, striatal dopamine function the D2 receptor, the D4 receptor, the D3 receptor, the dopamine transporter, and catecholomethyltransferase. And the um, area that's indicated in yellow, 
is the one where there was a significant association between the gene score for an individual, and we, we tested 60 individuals, and the modulation of activation. You see that for the composite score, Cohen's D has a value of 0.67, and you have uh, less, uh, less association or less, uh, less of an effect size with the individual genes. Um, but what we've done moving on beyond this kind of uh, candidate gene approach is we've moved to a polygenic uh, score, and we were fortunate to get together with Harriet DeWitt at the University of Chicago, where they had a sample of 1,000 healthy controls who did the balloon analog risk test and were genotyped. And we had here from the Consortium for Neuropsychiatric Phenomics uh, set up by Bob Builder uh, and a bunch of our colleagues. We had 1,600 individuals. And training a polygenic risk score uh, using GWAS data in um, one sample, we predicted the BART performance in terms of mean-adjusted pumps in the other sample. What's notable is that 11% of the variance uh, was due in, in performance of the task was due to genetics, and that's very high for a complex behavioral trait. Now, back to the methamphetamine users. Um, was modulation of activation in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex uh, what is the major uh, effect that you see during fMRI? And the answer is not really. Um, we had a region of interest analysis in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex where, in fact, this modulation of activation was, um, was related to risk or pump number in the healthy controls, but not the meth users. This, the cortical phenomenon was only in healthy controls. In contrast, the meth users, when deciding to take risk, they showed a greater modulation of activation in the ventral striatum than controls did. Now, the next question was, to what extent is the modulation of cortical activity during risk-taking related to the intrinsic activity of the brain when the person is at rest. And so we, we tested methamphetamine users and healthy controls at rest with functional magnetic resonance imaging. And here, the red area is this, um, this blue area is the area of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex where we tested for modulation of activation by risk. And the red areas, uh, which include um, orbitofrontal cortex, uh, insula, important areas in terms of what we think would, would be decision making, you see that positive uh, correlation between the connectivity of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and these regions at rest and the extent to which you have modulation of activity of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex when a person's taking risk. You do not see these relationships at all in the methamphetamine users. In fact, what you see is that connectivity of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex at rest with the anterior cingulate is negatively related to the modulation of activation in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex in methamphetamine users. Now, there's an awful lot uh, that can influence whether or not somebody is taking risk on the balloon analog risk task. Uh, and one of the things that could influence their behavior is loss aversion. People on the balloon analog risk task generally don't pump enough to optimally attain the, award, the reward that's there. We're loss averse. Um, and we would think that loss aversion would reduce pumping. And in fact, if you look at the methamphetamine users, loss aversion is, uh, in fact, uh, related to uh, 
actually you see in, in methamphetamine users, loss aversion is related to uh, the number of pumps they take. Uh, but in the control, it's negative related, negatively related. But in the controls, um, loss aversion is positively related to the number of pumps they take. And what this is due to is the fact that the methamphetamine users, while they're performing the task, don't update their behavior. They don't change their performance. Uh, they don't learn as rapidly as the healthy controls that the optimal strategy is to pump more. So what we've learned so far from these PET studies is that euphorogenic doses of cocaine will reduce cortical processing, that striatal dopamine release, which in fact, must be part of this euphorogenic effect of cocaine, contributes to uh, the acute effects of drugs of abuse and to cue-induced craving. Stimulant users have deficits in striatal dopamine receptors and inhibitory control functions, including D2-type receptors, uh, controlled functions, which we measured with the stop signal and reversal learning task. They also have problems with decision-making that involves D2-type dopamine receptors uh, measured on delayed discounting and, um, and other, other tasks, such as the balloon analog list, risk task. And so we would think that enhancing activity-dependent signaling through the D2 receptors could be a useful approach to treating methamphetamine use disorder. And from animal studies, we have gotten the idea that aerobic exercise could, in fact, be one of those types of treatments. And we see that uh, in the rat striatum, you have an increase in D2-type receptors in the striatum. You have um, an attenuation of age-related D2 receptor loss. And you have an increased expression of D2 mRNA, mRNA in the mouse striatum. By exercise. So Rick Rawson uh, started a study that we collaborated on where he had an eight-week intervention plus residential treatment as usual. They were in a therapeutic community, and the active treatment was uh, 40 to 50 minutes of aerobic and strength training uh, three times a week for eight weeks, and the control intervention was the same amount of time with an experienced trainer. Uh, in uh, an interactive health education program. And here, measuring uh, methamphetamine use days at baseline uh, and at one and three months of follow-up, you can see that treatment certainly worked. Uh, you even have an effect at three months. And it, in the heavy users who used more than 18 days a month before they went into treatment, there was really no difference between the two interventions. But in the lighter users who use fewer than 18 days a month, there was a remarkable and statistically significant difference between the exercise intervention and the control. And we found in a subset of these people that um, the health education control did nothing to D2-type dopamine receptors, but yet in the exercise training group, dopamine receptors were upregulated to the level uh, seen in healthy controls. That's wonderful. That's the only treatment that's upregulated up dopamine D2 receptors in people ever. And at the same time that this was going on, there was this large multi-site trial of nine sites called the STRIDE study, Stimulant Reduction Intervention Using Dosed Exercise. And it was a nine-site study, and the stimulant users were either meth users or cocaine users, or they could be MDMA users, just not nicotine or caffeine. They weren't considered hard enough stimulants. And there's a statistically significant but small effect in the exercise group compared to the health education. Now, mind you, these people were in uh, a 24-week program. The first three weeks, only three weeks, were inpatient. Our study was inpatient the whole time where they were supervised. And uh, 
And these statistically significant findings uh, show a uh, correction for adherence, which is not so easy to make people exercise every day if they're meth addicts who've left treatment. So what's the path forward? What are we thinking about? We're thinking about going beyond associations of D2 receptors with cognitive control and adaptive decision making. We know that these things are associated. We've shown that. But we'd like some causative data. We'd like to know if augmenting the D2 receptor availability with exercise or anything can actually change cognitive control and adaptive decision making. And then do those changes produce a reduction in drug use? Uh, we're also thinking in terms of developing pharmacological manipulations to augment the signaling through D2 dopamine receptors uh, to improve the balance, maybe D1 receptor antagonists, which could be really um, a big problem to work with because D1 systems are, of, of course, important. Um, but pharmacological manipulations would be really uh, a godsend because it's easier to have someone take a pill, especially if it doesn't make them throw up, than it is to make them get on a treadmill every day. Um, the other thing that we're thinking about is what are the mechanisms that exercise training uh, goes through to upregulate the D2 receptors and stimulant users. I know that many neuroscientists in the audience are thinking, oh, you know, is there some kind of effect on BDNF? But I'm actually um, really hoping and looking forward to working with my colleagues in uh, the basic sciences to where we can make local injections and make local measurements in the brain and relate them to behavior. And um, because of that, because of that ability to work with colleagues in this diverse environment, I'm really thrilled to be at UCLA. I'd like to just end by acknowledging uh, the help of all of these wonderful people. I'd like to especially make a shout out to Mark Mandelkern, who's really, you know, uh, he works at uh, UC Irvine and he runs the pet lab at the VA. And without him, none of this would have happened. Um, thank you, Mark. And uh, we started out at the Brain Mapping Center. Uh, I'd like to thank Roger Woods and Mary Susselman. Mary was the research associate that ran my lab, essentially, before she went to the Brain Mapping Center. And my wonderful colleagues throughout UCLA and the NIH grants that we've received. Thank you all very much. I think there's um, time for a few questions, and then there's a reception, I believe, outside afterwards. So, uh, any questions? They're hungry. Ah! It's a so, um, in terms of, I'm trying to understand what dopamine receptor availability means. Are you envisioning fewer physical receptors, or the fact that balance of dopamine is unavailable to your uh, Thank you for that question. I should have gone over that myself. Um, I'm envisioning fewer receptors, uh, but, but receptor availability means the number of receptors that are there open to the radio tracer binding. And you might think that if you have a lot of dopamine in the synapse, you're going to have fewer receptors, or you're going to have less receptor availability. Um, but because with positron emission tomography, we can't count receptors the way we can in an in, in, in vitro assay, um, we use models that, uh, that give us receptor availability. And one of my colleagues, Diana Martinez, uh, was asked this question when she was uh, reporting on lower receptor availability in cocaine users than healthy controls. And um, she answered the question uh, by bringing in the healthy controls and the cocaine users and giving them an agent that depleted dopamine and measuring what the effect of depleting dopamine would be on receptor availability. And in fact, there was essentially a 10% change in the healthy controls. Uh, there was a 16% change in the healthy controls, 
a 10% change in the cocaine users, indicating that if anything, uh, what she was doing is by a small amount underestimating the deficit. Yes? So, but uh, these sedative drugs also uh, produce uh, uh, food administration increases in dollar. Nowhere near the same as cocaine and other stimulants, but nevertheless, they do produce So, uh, if you were to compare the kind of changes, I'm, I'm sure you, you know the literature, how uh, uh, how does dependence on alcohol or cannabis translate to uh, the change in uh, D2 receptors? Well, there are, there are lower D2 receptors in alcoholics. And um, and there are lower dopamine receptors in smokers. Uh, but for some reason, the in smokers, it's only men that show the D2 receptor deficit. And in alcoholics, um, there's a relationship between D2 receptors and really vulnerability to the disease because the family members of individuals who um, have alcohol use disorder who have high D2 receptor availability um, are thought to be protected to some extent. Chris. Chris. Thank you. Great talk. I'm heartened by this idea that exercise can intervene to, to alter D2 receptors. So one of the things, exercise means a lot of different things. To people. So do you have some sense from these, this literature and your own studies, like how, what, what sort of exercise interventions what, what, what would you have to have, you know, whatever your subjects uh, do? Well, I can tell you what works, and I can't tell you how long someone has to do it. I can tell you that if they do three times a week, 40 to 50 minutes, primarily on a treadmill with a little bit of weight training, it works for eight weeks. Now, because we're dealing, we're now dealing with... Um, working with populations that are inpatients. And inpatients don't get to stay inpatients very long. They, they have to prove to their insurance company that they need to stay more than a month. So we now have a grant to do a, a study with this eight-week intervention, and yet we don't know if our research participants are going to stay in treatment so that we can supervise their exercise for eight weeks. So we're thinking about testing intermediate points to see how long they have to do it. But it's very complicated, um, or at least more complicated than we'd like it to be, because um, we don't know if it's the exercise we don't know how long they have to do the exercise. We don't know if it's the exercise training, because in the program, individuals come in, they're evaluated by an exercise physiologist, and they have an increased training program. So is it the training, or is it the exercise? And these are all factors that we'd like to tease out, but with respect to the reality of grant funding, we think that if you stick with a paradigm that works and ask the questions that we're more interested in, which is to what extent can you find a causal relationship between upregulating the dopamine receptors and the behaviors that we're measuring, we think that's more interesting. And we can't get them all funded at once, or we haven't done that yet. Well, 